Christian? Am I Muslim? And, okay, and, and here's you, and here's the person you're dating, because dating is practicing to see who you will marry if you guys align and everything, right? So they, they come into this relationship, this is you, this is the guy, and they take this physical, they wrap it, and they have sex, and they bond. And then they're forgetting that the rest of this, the intellect, the emotion, social, and spiritual needs to line up too, right? I mean, so the sex is the bonding tool. Then they, then they realize intellectually they don't line up. I want to go to college. He doesn't. I'm a Christian. He's not. And, and then they can't break up because they bonded already physically. So explain it to them if they leave the physical out and they just try to see, do we align intellectually? Do we align emotionally? Do we align socially and spiritually? And then sealing that deal after marriage with sex for that extra bond that needs to occur in a marriage. You know, and explaining to them that I am more than just a physical being. I have the rest of these parts to me, and that's what I'm trying to make match when I'm dating somebody, and that it's more than physical. I also use the example of, if this were more of a rubber glove, but I forgot one, so thank you for letting me have this from the kitchen, that you'll have lots of places and nonprofits that are teaching them about sex to wrap their physical, and then you'll be safe. So this is all that that looks like to me because I have so much more to me. What am I doing to protect the rest of me? A condom cannot do that. So I put the glove or the condom on my whole hands and I'm protecting all of me that is involved for the relationship or that is supposed to be involved with the relationship. And that's abstinence and that's waiting. And that's protecting the whole being. Explaining things like that to our meeting time is important. Intimacy promotes attachment and trust. I also use tape. Tape on my arm, and I say this is what sex would look like in marriage, because marriage is more than shared work between kids and children. Marriage is supposed to be a bond that holds us together, which is probably what we're missing when we see the divorce rates rising through the roof. So you put the tape on, the tape sticks, it's a bond. It's meant for marriage, right? You take the tape off, my funk is on it, I'm putting it on the next person I'm dating, I wait a few months, I date them, and the bond isn't the same as it was. It, it can't be, because it's been broke, okay? And these, and these youth are going through every relationship that they have, having sex, bonding, having sex, breaking up. You know, explain to them that your heart, you know, was in one piece when this all started, if you will. And then afterwards, you know, how do you think you can be the same person from being broken and hurt and sexually active? And then, you know, you heal for a month, maybe it takes for you. It might take six months for me, but I, I date again. And then you have sex again and you break up and you just chip away at your heart and your emotions and trying to explain to them that if you want that bond to seal the way that it's supposed to, it's meant for marriage. And every time you're breaking it and going back and forth with it, you're, you're, you're ruining the bond that was there. And the only way to get that bond back up to the ability that it was meant to have is to put time and abstinence between you and the activities so that you can start developing other things. <clears throat> so really it's about sexual risk avoidance versus sexual risk reduction in my program. Uh, public schools really want to teach to reduce the risk. Okay, really, you know, they may tell their children, we want you to wait until you're married to have kids, and we want you to wait until you're married to um, have sex. But if you don't, make sure you use contraception or you use a condom. And that, that mixed message is confusing our youth. So we're not trying to reduce the risk in life choices, we're trying to help people avoid the risks. That's the best way to be healthy. Um, I look at the other forums for any risky behavior with our youth and tell them no. Don't smoke. It'll harm you. We don't say, well, we want you to not smoke, but we know we're, you're going to. So here's how you pack them, here's how you light it, and use an extra long filter for a little more protection. We don't tell them that in that forum. We don't tell them that when it comes to drinking and driving. Like, you know, why don't you reduce your risk of drinking and driving? So when you get pulled over, you can probably pass the test. So why don't you drink a little at home before, weigh yourself, get the mix right, so that you can walk, reduce your risk if you get pulled over. We don't get that message on any other form of risky behavior with our children, and I don't understand why we don't do that when it comes to sex, because the uh, repercussions are epidemic. And I'll stop because I can keep going. The third program that we have at Life Choices Center is the Beyond the Choice program, and it's an abortion recovery program. Um, we want everybody to know that comes through our doors, what all of your options are, what they include, and we want to work with you on them, and we hope you don't choose abortion because of the effects that it has on you for the rest of your life. But we know that some are going to, and our doors are always opened, and we still love them anyways, and we hope
hope that they would come back. Um, we see 50-year-old women, 70-year-old women, um, who've been carrying the abortion secret around for a long time. Uh, lots of times, if I'm talking to an older group of women, I'll ask them, does anybody in here have abortion? Oh, I say, well, I have, and, and I'll explain it to them, and then you'll see them start to be honest. Okay, so if it's legal and it's okay, why aren't we all talking about it? So that's really what this program is about, is to get you to understand that you don't have to spin the secret. It can be put out there, it can be put out in a loving environment, and you can heal and, and seek Jesus' forgiveness and um, what all of that can do for you. So real quick, the history of abortion since Roe versus Wade, 1973, which was the legal case that passed it, okay? 54 million abortions have occurred. So if we break that down and touch, that's 3,800 a day, 160 an hour, one abortion every 22 seconds. So sitting here and listening to us for 40 minutes, 140 abortions have occurred. Specifically in New York State, we are ranked number 18 across the country for the states for pregnancy, for teen pregnancies. But we rank number one for abortion. It's easy to get Medicaid to fund your abortion. One reason why we have abortion rates so high. Two, there's no parental consent. You may need a note to get off the bus at your friend's house down the street, or they won't let you off, but you do not need a note from your parents to go have an abortion. There's no waiting period involved, so I can go to the pregnancy center, I can find out I'm pregnant, I can get into the abortion clinic today, I can go from one spot to the next and get rid of what I think is my problem, okay? So the no waiting period doesn't give anybody any time to hear any other truth, and it just causes you to react to something. And so um, this is one reason why we rank so high. Now, again, remember, I'm on campus at SUNY when I'm doing this presentation, so I'm, say, I'm asking them, who has abortions? According to this pod, which is the Baker Institute is a research arm for Planned Parenthood and the Center for Disease Control. So from 15 to 24 years old, that's the, the youth who are making up half of the percentage of who's having an abortion. So on campus, what does that look like? 12,000 students average, let's say half are women, that's 6,000. 10% of them are having abortions. So that's 600 pregnant women on campus. So I asked the class, do you see 600 pregnant women on campus every year? No. So then what's happening? I think this is where I stop. And I let my friend Susan come up. I'm going to introduce Susan Stoddard. She's been with our center for six years. She is a volunteer. She's one of those people I tell you we should not um, exist to do what we do without. Um, she does parenting classes. She does mentoring one-on-one, -on -one, and she also helps teach the abortion. <coughs> Susan Sides. Hi. Good morning, everybody. You guys are such a friendly church. I had people hugging me when I came in. I don't have a pocket on these crazy pants. And one of the lovely ladies who um, met me this morning, her name is Portia, but it's not like a car that we're going to talk about. <laughs> but, um, I just thought about that. But thank you so much and for having us here. And uh, if you need a little break, you want to stand up and breathe if you can. It's a lot to take in. Um, and I, I share that I um, I grew up in this area, I lived in the Rochester area for a while. And I know your pastor. Um, he, um, I was in a youth group at West Endicott Baptist, and there was this girl in my youth group named Sheila Edwards. So <laughs> he'd show up all the time. I wish I had a story to tell because he was always so funny. <laughs> I, I assume he still is. So then um, I moved back to the area. It was at Davis College. And then a couple, three years ago, I came to this church to do the outside fair. And there was Marshall. So just me how things all kind of come together. And I had no idea I'd be doing what I'm doing now. But anyways, let's, we'll get serious here. So um, no one wants an abortion like they want an ice cream home or a Porsche. They want an abortion as an animal caught in a trap wants to gnaw up its leg. I know it's pretty graphic, but when a woman seeks an abortion, or she seeks to have an abortion, um, she's trying to escape a really desperate situation. And it's by an act of self-violence and loss. And that's not what our society says today. Um, it's not a sign that we're free in any way, but a sign that we are desperate. And 
So who has abortions? Who has abortions? One out of three women will have an abortion by the age of 45. That was me. 40 to 50 percent will have more than one. That was me too. 56 percent um, are in their early 20s, saying that was me. And 78 percent have religious affiliations. And I will tell you that since I have been um, in this ministry, at my own, even at my own church, I've been approached by people that I've known my whole life, some good, some bad. Um, we're not here, like Fairlene said, to judge you today if you're one of those people. Um, and even in my group of friends, people, uh, just recently, a couple of my friends, and one's 65 and one is 55, and shared their abortions with me that they had never shared before. So it's out there, and it's very windy. So why does someone have an abortion? Well, I told you my name is Susan, and I'm one of those people. And I found myself in an unplanned pregnancy, which was a long time ago. But um, I lived with my boyfriend, just like people do now. It's not, nothing all that different. And um, I had no money. I was estranged from my family. My boyfriend was going to California. I was graduating from college. I went to Brockport School. And um, he was going, my, my boyfriend was going away for the summer. I was living with another friend, I had a job, so like there's just no way that a child would fit into that scenario. And of course it was 1974, so abortion was legal. And uh, I went into Planned Parenthood in Rochester. Didn't, I don't know if there were any life choices or care nets around, but I, I didn't know of any. And they told me physically how they would, uh, how the abortion would go, tuning for the suction, all of that sort of stuff, and um, I had the procedure done, and it was it was more painful than they said, but um, I don't know if it was just that physical pain as much as as how I felt, and I know now one of the reasons is, is when we become pregnant, we have, we bond with that baby whether we want the baby or not right away, and so um, you know, take something like that away, um, it's it's pretty traumatic. So I left the facility and I, I really felt very cold and alone. And of course, I didn't share it with anybody but my ex and my best friend. And um, gosh, I was relieved though. I took care of the problem. I could go on with my life, graduate from Brockport, go, I worked in Rochester, get a teaching job. And um, but that, that relief is short lived. It's like a uh, band aid, you know, and that band aid comes off and that, that sore is still there. And, gets opened up now and then. Um, and you know, the funny thing is that my boyfriend and I, we never, I know, we never spoke of it. Never. Never. So it was all in here. Sorry about that. So I guess, you know, I really try to think of why I did, why I had my abortion. And um, when I became pregnant, I had a choice. You know, I either got rid of it or embrace, embrace the pregnancy. And, at that point in my life, um, I believed I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. Guess what? Four years later, I married a guy. And isn't that the way? And we find that so much at the center. Women keep doing them. We do the same thing over and over. And so I married him. And I found myself pregnant again. And I really wanted to have this baby. Um, his brother was living with us. I, I was a teacher, you know, pretty well into life. But he didn't want to. And I guess... I wanted him more than a baby. And um, I began to justify having to avoid my child. Um, I was living a pretty unhealthy lifestyle. And, and I'm going to show you a slide in a couple of minutes that'll kind of explain that. And um, I was using drugs and alcohol. I had disordered eating. And I think the bottom line was I just believed that I didn't deserve to have a child because I hadn't dealt with my first abortion. So I go into Rochester again and do the same thing. Unbelievable to me. And sometimes I look at these, this paper I have in front of me and know what's in my head, and sometimes it's hard to believe that that was me, but it was. And um, you know, my life, my life was um, never the same. It, it, it was never the same. 